Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association's webinar, Artist Residency Programs, Living and Creating in an Inspirational Setting. Today's webinar is made possible with a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, and this is part of a new initiative to engage artists and Native nations to help build Native arts programs in their communities and promote artists and art events through our website, nativeamerica.travel. My name is Melanie Laborwit and Native Art and Culture Coordinator at IENTA. I've worked many years with museums, developing public sector programs, celebrating regional traditional heritage and culture, and I'm working now to grow partnerships with Native nations, artists, and regional museums, galleries, and cultural centers, and to raise visibility and access um, for tribal resources and culture. It is an exciting time to join IANTA as we move to empower Native American artists and develop their markets and elevate awareness of the role that Native artists play in cultural tourism, as well as heritage preservation. In today's webinar, we'll hear from Native artists, galleries, and cultural centers who will share their experiences with Native artist residencies in different models across the country. An artist's immersive experience may be used to invite artists to reflect new ways to see a national park, or wildlife areas, it might be an opportunity for several artists at once to inspire one another in collective studios, or it might be time for an emerging artist to develop new work and have an opportunity to stay, work, display, or perform new works in gallery or theater settings. How can museums use their expertise, space, and collections and programs that educate and engage the public in Native communities that they serve? How can individual artists get involved and find out where they can learn and grow their work in inspiring places and grow new audiences? How have artist residencies fostered community support for the museum and implemented diverse educational programs focused on arts and cultural enrichment? Stay tuned at the end for some leads on new funding resources and lots of great inspiration. For those who you are not familiar with IANTA, for nearly two decades, IANTA has served as the national voice for American Indian nations and Native Hawaiians engaged in cultural tourism. In addition to serving as the voice for Indian country tourism, IANTA provides technical assistance and training to tribal nations and Native owned enterprises engaged in cultural tourism, hospitality and recreation and the arts. IANTA's mission is to define, introduce, grow, and sustain American Indian, Alaska, Native Hawaiian tourism that honors traditions and values. Please save the date for IANTA's 25th annual American Indian Tourism Conference, October 2 to 5, um, this year at the Choctaw Casino Resort in Durant, Oklahoma. This year's theme is We Are Still Here. Sponsorship opportunities are available. Visit our website at ienta.org to learn more about education program offerings. And um, we are going to get started. Um, so our first, um, we have three wonderful panelists um, today. Um, Delbert Anderson is Dine, he's a professional musician. He creates um, Dine inspired musical pathways, um, preserving cultural music by creating a foundation of traditional melodies and fusing them with jazz, jam, and funk. His compositions serve indigenous culture through stories, healing stories, and collaboration. And he has been featured on in New York Times, Jazz Times, FNX Television, all over the media universe. Um, Anderson was recently awarded the Cultural Capital Fellowship 2023 for the First Peoples Fund, the Jazz Road Touring Grant from South Arts for this year, Arts Forward funded by Mello, Andrew Mellon Foundation, among many others. Um, in addition to performing, Delbert Anderson is currently serving on numerous arts organization boards. And I found out about him because I'd heard him play and then I saw that he was awarded a, a residency with the National Parks at Hawaii Volcanoes that he'll be attending later this year. So we'll be learning more about how um, to get involved. Um, Audrey Jacob Choctaw is Director of Choctaw Nation, um, Director of Art at Choctaw Nation, and she wears a lot of hats at the Choctaw Cultural Center. The Choctaw Cultural Center is dedicated to exploring, preserving, and showcasing the culture and history of Choctaw people. And Audrey's worked with the tribe in cultural programs and education for many years. 
and is going to talk about the, the initiative that they started at the Cultural Center. And uh, Jeremy Dennis Shinnecock is going to be uh, joining us as lead artist and founder of Ma's House and BIPOC Art Studio. And he's a contemporary fine art photographer and um, in Southampton, New York, lead artist and founder of the nonprofit Ma's House. In his work, he explores indigenous identity, cultural and assimilation. He holds an MFA from Penn State University in Pennsylvania and a BA in studio art from Stony Brook, New York. He currently lives and work in Southampton, New York on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. And he'll be joining us to tell us about the residence that he created for um, BIPOC um, at Ma's house that he developed. And over 20 artists have participated in the studio project since its inception. And finally, we have a special guest, uh, Jenny Terman, who is artist communities and presenting and multidisciplinary work specialist with the National Endowment for the Arts. And in addition to serving as multidisciplinary work specialist with the NEA, she serves on a, their native artist working group. And so we're gonna learn a little bit more about that. She has a background in ethnomusicology, has worked with community arts programs and with performing arts centers and has so much to share with us today about opportunities with the NEA. So there we go, we're gonna get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope I didn't speak too quickly. We've got so much to cover. So we're going to ask a number of questions throughout the webinar today, um, both to find out who's attending and also to assess some um, how we can help you better and also for our panelists to learn a little bit more about what it is that you're looking for. So our first question is, have you ever hosted an artist in residence program at your tribal museum, cultural center or resort and casino? So there are multiple possibilities of where you might um, host an artist in residence program. And um, there's a lot of opportunity out there, but we were gauging that most of you, as it looks like, have not. And we're interested in learning about those of you who did. And so far about 60% people have participated and we have about, uh, 10% yes and 90% no. Oh, it's moving. It's 2080. So that's a little bit better. So that's great. So we're going to finish that up. Um, we have a 20% have per, um, created artist residency programs and about 80% have not. So um, we're going to learn a lot more about um, how to go about doing that. So thank you very much. If you want to share those results or I think we can just make, move along. So we're gonna go to the next section and um, we're going to get started. Audrey, let's start with the Tribal Cultural Center. We'll be sharing your presentation now and let us know when to move to the next slide. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Audrey Jacob and I serve as the Director of Arts and Artist Registry at the Choctaw Nation. I'm very fortunate to have an office located in this beautiful facility, the Choctaw Cultural Center, which is before you. And um, you can also see another view if you advance to the next slide. That's the entrance to our facility. Um, that's a sculpture there in the very front of the Tushkahoma Choctaw War uh, Red Warrior. <laughs> And uh, we also had miniature sculptures available for purchase in our gift store. Um, this sculpture is also placed at our Capitol Museum. And uh, a lot of artists, I would say probably over 50 artists were engaged for the artwork at the Cultural Center uh, during the planning. So I'd like to go ahead and get started um, with just sharing a little bit about um, how we decided to develop an artist in residency program. And during our inaugural year, that credit goes to Stacy Halfmoon. She served as the senior director of the Cultural Center during our inaugural year. And she's the one that had the vision for an artist in residency program. Um, 
So with that, we did submit for a grant through NEA. So Jenny, I'm glad you're on the call today. Uh, and we did receive funding for it. It was a $10,000 grant and with a match at a total 20,000. With that, we uh, chose to pursue an artisan residency program and, you know, being mindful of the learning gap, uh, it was very new to us. We did add into the grant to work with a consultant. So we worked with Dawn Spears. She's Choctaw Narragansett. And um, she helped us. She did a lot of research with the different facilities. She is a former participant in an artist in residency program. And she helped us uh, develop a framework, including, you know, what items would be covered in the residency, um, other items to consider, what our options were in the timeline. You know, and we did have challenges with the COVID year, so we wanted to have more than one option, something that would be a short term, super short term residency, maybe just two weeks, uh, maybe a month. And then, you know, as we continue to grow, we wanted this framework to be able to be flexible enough to suit our needs in the very beginning, but then also um, be able to suit our needs more long term. So I believe there was also a six month and a year long artist residency as part of the initial framework. What we implemented was a month long artist in residency, and it was held at the Choctaw Cultural Center in May during our inaugural year. Um, we selected a professional artist, Loretta Newby Coker, and during that selection process, we have a registry of over 1,400 Choctaw artists, and so we communicated a call to artists in a weekly digest that went out to all of them through email, and um, basically just asking them if they were interested, and then we had a form survey developed, um, sent a link to that so that they could tell us about um, all of the artwork that they create, um, how they, what level they considered themselves to be, whether that was an emergency, uh, I'm sorry, emerging artist, a mid-career artist, or a an established professional artist. And um, we didn't receive an overwhelming response like we, like we thought we would, um, but we did receive several submissions. And we narrowed that down based on the two that were considered professional artists. Uh, with this being our first year, we wanted to have someone with experience in working with the public, different age groups. It was May, so as the school year was closing out, we were still having some schools visiting uh, with field trips, and we were also having families coming through, getting ready for the summer. And so we did select Loretta Newby Coker. She's a, a retired art educator, multimedia artist. And she also, you know, being retired, had the flexibility to stay a whole month at the Choctaw Cultural Center. So she set up in our um, main main lobby. Here, let me say, I might have gotten ahead of myself. No, not that. Okay. So she set up in our main lobby, and um, she basically just created art the whole time while she was while she was there. Um, here's here's a list of some of the items that are the artwork that she created. She did scrimshaw, silver point. Uh, she made a mosaic, one of which was actually donated to the cultural center. Um, charcoal, oil pastel, chalk, acrylic, watercolor, ink, and then she also created um, a work with coffee wash. And it was a portrait of Joseph Oklahoma, one of our Choctaw co talkers. And so that was really neat. The full range of artwork that she was able to present, um, I think, really demonstrated the type of art that can be created regardless of your access to supplies. You know, the coffee we, um, wash artwork is very simple. I wanted to um, share the space that um, the art was shared in, too. Okay. Um, we could go to a couple slides. Well, it's um, three slides ahead, and then we could go back and talk about the facility in general that she was in. So that would be slide eight. The next one there, I think it is. Yeah. There we go. So this is Loretta Newby Coker. She served as our artist in residence. 
And the slide just before this one is our main lobby. And this is where um, this is where she set up. So you can see that she um, had a table there to meet and greet the public. In this view, we have an art educator greeting and giving the intro to the facility. On the very last slide, um, slide 10, this is a mosaic that she created. So after the artist in residence, uh, she created this mosaic of the Chaka Cultural Center based on a photo. Super amazing. Um, it's something that is now hanging just outside of our Coachito Theater and is absolutely beautiful. Some previous work that Loretta had done as uh, doing a mosaic of the old Tallahina Hospital uh, whenever we created a new one. And so we got the idea of, hey, what about uh, maybe a mosaic of our Choctaw Cultural Center to commemorate, you know, its early beginnings. So she did do that for us. And she was super, she was super thankful to have that opportunity. And we were glad to have her do that. But there's plenty of space throughout the Choctaw Cultural Center for artwork. Can so, we go back to see some of the grounds? Yes. That'd be great. Um, Thank you, Melanie. Here we can is, talk a little bit about that. Okay, so here is the mound view um, in the back of the Choctaw Cultural Center. It's in our Living Village area. Um, in the future, we do plan to host a premier art market. So we're looking at all of our spaces available to be able to accommodate that. This may be one of the spaces. Um, it also you know, may be indoors. That's something that we're still looking at. So this is a gallery space, and I just want to be clear that this gallery space is not actually at the Choctaw Cultural Center, but the exhibit itself did transition to the Choctaw Cultural Center. And um, Choctaw Kins and Klansmen, and commemorates the Choctaw Irish Connection. Here is an upcoming exhibit. It's going to open on July 22nd to the public. In looking at um, the items that we have available in our collections, we have a lot of baskets. And um, so that's what we'll begin with in July. Uh, for those of you who will be traveling to the IENSA conference, we hope to see you here at the Choctaw Cultural Center. We're just right across the highway from the venue and this exhibit should still be on display. Do you expect to do any kind of um, programming during the basket exhibit with demonstrations or anything like that, or even like one day, not not, not a month residency, but um, people who might be able to come in and do demonstrations as part of the exhibit? So yes, um, we do have cultural educators on staff and they uh, create baskets. I've seen several elbow baskets that they've made. So they will be on, um, on site and they do daily demonstrations in the main lobby area. We're also working with another artist, Elizabeth Mitchell, and she recently visited the cultural center. Uh, one of her goals is to work with our princesses and royalty uh, through the Choctaw Nation to be able to help them create their own purse baskets. So in the pageants, um, whenever they have their regalia, a purse basket is usually, you know, what they carry. And um, a lot of Mississippi Choctaws make those baskets. Um, we don't currently have a lot of weavers in Oklahoma, so she was willing to help us out, and we hope to expand that workshop as well. And could you maybe share a little bit about um, what you hope to get um, launching the residency program at the Culture Center and if you're going to do it again? Okay, so yes, we are going to do it again. We're still looking for funding. Um, we submitted in partnership with the Oklahoma State University. Uh, we submitted a grant with the National Science Foundation and a goal for that one. So, you know, we went from indoor, just the start in kind of had a bigger idea. We were looking at creating uh, public art. So we were considering um, in the interest of uh, an aer aerodynamic top workforce, developing an aerodynamic top workforce. We were wanting to add an art element to that goal. And so what we were looking at is creating a kinetic sculpture 
and then partnering that with education programming to where participants, youth participants, would be able to create many models of the same kinetic sculpture incorporating some type of Choctaw symbolism. We will hear next month um, whether or not we received it. It's exciting. So we wish you luck and, and that's really exciting work. Um, we have another poll question to get a better, help Choctaw get a better idea of what to include um, in their next program series. Um, from an artist's perspective, what is the most compelling benefit of being an artist in residence? And whether you have or you haven't, or you imagine you might be, um, go ahead and, and complete the survey based on what you think would be the best benefit. Um, time to work inspiration from the place that you're working in, widening your audience, meeting visitors, compensation, and um, sharing tribal culture through my art. So um, I think we've got about almost half of you finished. We're gonna let a few more seconds there for people to fill that out. And with almost 70% answered, it looks like um, uh, we, we're not quite there yet. Um, we, it looks like we that time to work has about 58% of respondents, 25% of you are inspired. Um, 25% are looking to widen your audience, 25%. Um, would um, are compelled by compensation and 75% um, about our sharing tribal culture through their art, which is wonderful. Um, so um, we can um, move on to the next section. I thanks so much. I can't wait um, to visit the Choctaw Cultural Center. Those of you who may have um, questions. I just want to remind people that there we are putting links in the chat so that if you want to learn more about the Choctaw Cultural Center or their activities or follow them on social media, we have those links in the chat and you're more than welcome to add um, questions there as well. So um, hopefully we'll have a chance to visit at the AATC conference in October. And next I'd like to welcome Jeremy Dennis to tell us about his ambitious project, Ma's House and how it has evolved and thrived. Oh, well, so let's go forward morning. with that one. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, so good to see you all. My name is Jeremy Dennis. I'm the lead artist of a up and coming um, and modest, I would say, <laughs> um, artist residency called Ma's House and BIPOC Art Studio. We're located on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation in Southampton, New York. And this was uh, really a project that came out of the pandemic, sort of one of those silver lining projects where um, I am also a digital photographer. I love portraiture and landscape, looking at Native history and trying to fill in the gaps in our representation. And so before the pandemic, I was going residency to residency. Um, that was my lifestyle. <laughs> I got 90% or more of my art completed as a resident artist. Um, just because of the resources, the network. It's like you're going to a utopia where everyone you meet is an artist. And that I think that's how it should be, um, just to have the outlet, the healing through art, the creativity, and so on. And so when the pandemic came, um, my family and I were living down the road from our old family home, which you see on the slide. This is my um, grandmother's home built in the 1960s. And unfortunately, here at Shinnecock, even though we're based in what is known as the Hamptons, where some of the top one percenters live. Um, we, however, have um, major issues with poverty. So according to the um, last published census, a family um, um, median income is about $10,000. And so trying to refurbish or take care of a home is almost an impossibility unless you have some sort of business or wealth um, outside of what is common. And so um, as an artist, that was even more compounding of an issue. <laughs> so 
when we had this idea of turning this house that was falling in on itself into a um, space, we started to go fund me. We raised over uh, 40,000 plus dollars in addition to many in-kind things like furniture and so on. And so with that generosity, we really wanted to dedicate it to communal art. And um, we started um, in June 2020, which is one of the peak moments of the pandemic. So one thing that we witnessed is that frontline workers who couldn't just like come out to the Hamptons and live off of their savings in their 20s and 30s. Um, many frontline workers were people in communities of color. So that was one reason we chose um, BIPOC artists to focus on. Um, that's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And the other um, thing that uh, spurred that decision was um, George Floyd's murder in May of 2020 and the BLM movement. So um, here at Shinnecock, because we're so close to where first Europeans um, arrived in the 16th and 17th century, we have such a mixed heritage. Uh, we have um, Black, white ancestors, everything else. And so um, BIPOC just made the most sense. Uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. So um, we actually have a documentary as part of the Reciprocity Project. Um, we can click on the link. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to let it play in the background on mute. And you can also go to that uh, URL and watch it at your own uh, leisure with the um, mute off. <laughs> so I'm also going to pop that into the chat. Oh, Sherry did as well. Thank you. <laughs> But while we're getting that up on the screen, I just wanted to talk about, um, like, we're all here. We've all heard of artist residencies before. Do we really need a new residency? And I would say um, yes. Um, so again, Ma's house is based on the Shinnecock Reservation. There's only a handful of uh, residency programs on reservations. But one thing that um, I think is the benefit of this and the design to have it located on this territory is that it helps battle or fight against the invisibility of Native Americans. So um, one thing that we have uh, that we're proud of is our annual Labor Day weekend powwow. Ours is the largest on the East Coast. We have over uh, 40,000 people who come through in this one weekend. And so I think that's really amazing, but you really can't have um, all of an artist's income dependent on four days out of the year. And so there's that. There's also the issue of our tribal museum and um, cultural center, which is a beautiful building, a beautiful collection, but that's also been closed for seven years. So what we're trying to do with this modest space is turn it into a hub for interactivity. Um, in addition to the issue of invisibility, I live in um, Suffolk County, which is where the Hamptons is located. And according to demographics, it's over 83% white population. The median um, age is 55 plus, and the native uh, population is 0.7%. And so on top of that um, really staggering statistic, um, we also live in one of the most segregated places um, <laughs> in the country. So you can actually look at a map. You can just point to different regions and say, those are different um, income levels. Those are different racial groups. And it's almost um, uh, mathematical in a way. So it's really a miracle that we're still here. And so with Ma's House, I really wanted to highlight that fact of that incredible story. Um, for example, we've been here for 10,000 years. How is it that today in the 21st century we're rendered invisible? And so one of the ways that I found that is so beneficial to everyone is that we bring in artists of all um, backgrounds, um, all artists of color, no matter the medium. Um, and we ask them uh, during their two week or so stay to engage with Shinnecock culture, engage with Shinnecock land, engage with our current day issues and try to create work around that. And so one example is um, we had a Puerto Rican um, artist, um, Yacoub Reyes, he's a printmaker but he actually did research before coming, which is amazing. He researched the Shinnecock Kelp Farmers, which is a uh, six uh, Shinnecock woman led initiative to clean up our local bays using indigenous kelp. And so he used wheat paste, he used graffiti, he used murals to highlight their work and also um, help 
create fundraising towards their initiative. So this is just one of many examples of how bringing in artists to an indigenous community or Indian reservation can benefit the other uh, being uh, just the cultural exchange, cultural appreciation. Um, the outside world um, in the Hamptons especially <laughs> is very ignorant towards Shinnecock culture, for example, and it's not their fault. It's just what we were um, taught or what we weren't taught, I should say, in public school. And so with that, I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, we have a um, work to do in terms of educating the public, um, but not just the outside world. Um, one thing that was so um, surprising to me is that even within Shinnecock community, we have bias, we have prejudice, we have racism towards other groups. And so part of that is just the design I mentioned earlier. Um, we're all separated racially. We're only uh, allowing ourselves to imagine each other's races based on popular culture, crime, things we see in the news. And so at Ma's house, we have a opportunity to gather. We have an opportunity to re-envision and ed educate each other. Just that simple um, political action of coming together when there were um, sometimes no other opportunities to do it in the past. And so um, going to the uh, film that's going on in the background, <laughs> it's a lot of my family members. So my older sister, Kelly, my uh, mom, there's my dad who is very shy, but he helps with a major renovation. But uh, as Mel Melanie mentioned um, earlier, we basically started from scratch. We started with an uninhabitable, an uninhabitable house that was struck with mold. Raccoons were living inside. It was entirely um, 3,000 square feet um, heated by this very small um, wood burning stove. There was no um, heating system and the plumbing was all leaky. Um, on top of that, it was built on a dirt floor. <laughs> so over a year and a few months, we used that fundraising money to totally transform the space. And today, um, some of our accomplishments include having over 24 artists and artisan residents come uh, since August 2021. Um, we've had um, everything from visual artists, poets, performers, dancers, everything between. So there's no medium restriction. Um, we've also been lucky to be supported by the Creatives Rebuild New York initiative, which allows us to be salaried workers for two years. We also give stipends to resident artists. And um, I really love the idea of um, personally going to other residencies so I definitely want to apply for the Choctaw um, Cultural Center. I also want to apply for IAIA. They have the uh, amazing undergrad and MFA program in New Mexico, but they also have a established residency for Native artists. Um, I also want to shout out the Forge Project in Hudson, New York. They're uh, almost our neighbors, even though they're three or four hours away, at least, <laughs> driving. Um, but we look up to them for their residency and support for Native artists. And really, um, one thing that's unfortunate is our uh, residency program is so um, of interest. There's so much interest in attending that we had to close off the residency portal for this year. So usually every January, we open it up and schedule for the whole rest of the year. So if there's anyone on the call who's interested, I can give you a link early and you can either apply and be on the wait list or you can also come and visit us to get a sense of Shinnecock land, what we have to offer. We have different facilities, we have different resources, networking opportunities. And so the expectation for Moss House is that you come for two weeks at a time, you do one public event, you engage with Shinnecock history or culture, and some artists uh, leave a work or two behind. So we have an amazing collection of what those artists were inspired by, what they produced, and it's almost as if they um, never left in some ways because of those objects. And so it's really um, beautiful in so many different ways. So um, maybe we can go to the next slide and those who want to continue can keep watching on the link. <laughs> sure. I'm also gonna pop the website in the chat. So we have uh, poll question number three. Um, has anyone else turned a vacant space on native land into an art space or artist residence? So we'll give people 40 seconds or so and um, we'll pop up the results. Yeah. 
It looks like you're a pioneer in this regard, Jeremy. Although we have, we have yeah, almost 10% says yes. So I'm looking forward to um, hopefully all of those who are listening who have done that. I would love to hear from you. <laughs> so we know who you are and, and we can also make sure to um, put those places on our Native America Got Travel um, website so that we can help um, drive visitors um, to learn more about the exhibits and programs that you have on those places. So yeah, that's where it looks at. We've got 8% uh, and 92% say no, but 8% say yes. So we're, we want to learn more about you and, and maybe uh, Jeremy's story will inspire those of you who might be thinking about it to, um, to um, follow through with a project like this. Hmm. Um, Absolutely. So I'm curious about, <laughs> I was going to say an echo. I'm curious about that one out of 12 who said yes. But um, this is the gallery space. So um, in addition to having a residency all year round, we have a pretty formal um, gallery space that we show two month at a time exhibits. My partner, Brianna, curates that space and also works at the local parish art museum. But in this image, um, we have uh, resident artist Ayasha Garin, who actually did a short film documentary with one of our um, Oyster Hatchery tribal members, um, Mila. And um, they went to the coastline. They took this amazing art and documentarian, um, beautiful uh, film. And that's what we're seeing on the screen. So every time we have a resident artist, we invite the public, we invite tribal community to come and engage. And it's always a culturally enriching and educational experience. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and so we have a podcast as well. My cousin Hunter Begun is the dir director of production. So he does um, interviews with every single artist we exhibit, every artist in residence, every artist that's involved in any way. So it's a great way to highlight and tell um, one story. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is my uh, mother, uh, Denise Silva Dennis. Uh, she's a retired art teacher, but a lot of people ask, uh, is she Ma? <laughs> but Ma was actually my grandmother. Um, she was a housemaker, house builder, um, many, many different ways, the family uh, matriarch. And so she never drove. She um, was at Ma's house at all times, and that's how it got its name. But she passed in 1998, and she always said that if nothing else, this family home should become a a uh, historic um, space to celebrate Shinnecock and family history, and that's what we're uh, doing. But in this slide, my mom is demonstrating a Iroquois-style uh, beading uh, technique. And so every Friday, 6 to 8, we have weekly workshops that are free to attend, free materials. We even invite um, artists of color to come and visit. Oh, it's a very modest uh, stipend, so <laughs> people from out of state might not be as compelling. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is another Indigenous artist, uh, Jamie John, who's based in Michigan. And as you can see on the table, he's using these um, Edward Curtis-esque um, source material, remixing them and showing that we um, are still here and we can still be a dynamic culture. We're not just stuck in the past or static. Uh, next slide, please. And then poll question number four, uh, what are the barriers that you have and participating in a residency program. So we have um, time and travel and expenses, um, time off from work. Uh, I know a lot of people only have like a few weeks or a month. Uh, C says not, uh, not knowing what you will get out of it. Um, so just the uncertainty of what's there, what facilities, what tools. Uh, D is money. Is it worth the time? Um, so again, we do uh, $500 honorariums. Um, do you already get paid that much or do you already have a job that is better worth your time? And then sharing tribal culture through one's art. Um, so that's very important and what we're trying to highlight as well. we'll give people a moment to share and we'll see the results. And one thing I would say um, 
from these answers actually is A and D are so important. There's um, dozens, there's hundreds of residencies. And I always say to um, other artists, don't pay a fee to apply, um, don't pay a fee to stay. There's so many residencies that are free, so many residencies that cook meals for you, they give you a money and material stipend. So just look out for those and try not to <laughs> be taken advantage of. That's really important advice. So thank you very much for sharing that experience that you've had. So um, it looks like um, not everybody is, is participated in this, but it looks like travel time and expenses is um, about 80%, a little over that. Time off of work, which is just dealing with reality is 67% is a barrier um, for a lot of people. Um, nobody's unsure about about the project, which is awesome. And nobody is worried about sharing their tribal culture um, because that's what artists do. Um, and there's only about 17% are concerned about the money. I think um, I think in a lot of it in the artist community, I mean, it's a concern. Um, and, you know, so understanding the compensation part of it is important, but it's not the driving reason why we make art or or do what we do. So I think that's really important. So um, we'll go on to the next slide. Thank you very much for answering. Yep, so I just have a few left. Um, this is highlighting one of my mother's pieces. It has the Atlantic right whale, which is indigenous to our Atlantic coast. It should be um, moving up the coast north now into the warmer waters. But um, this is just an example of what you can actually accomplish. So some people come in, um, they have no beating experience and create a masterpiece thanks to my mom's lead. And it's not just for native um, community members. Um, it's open to the public. It's free again to attend. And um, sometimes we do have native only events, but it's um, only a handful of time. So we try to be inclusive because um, other institutions are so elite. <laughs> they have so many barriers, accessibility issues. They feel like you don't belong and you stick out. So here we want you to feel like no matter where you're coming from, you can always belong and um, accomplish something. Next slide, please. And then this is um, what our current exhibit is until July 22nd. This is Akwesasne Mohawk artist Margaret Jacobs. The top right is a very heavy, solid uh, steel um, sculpture mixing botanicals with um, a tool <laughs> shed materials with a little bench. And on the bottom left, that's an indigenous plant made out of brass that you can actually pin to your lapel. And so we have um, hours open by appointment, so you can come and check out the show. But this is actually inspired by the Mohawk um, history of building skyscrapers and the steel associated with that and what made them famous um, in major metropolitan areas. So. Uh, Margaret's using that iconography with traditional iconography and just showing that um, identity transforms over time in that way. Uh, next slide, please. And then poll question number five, have you ever applied to be an artist in residence at a museum or a park? Oh. Oh, it's changing. I was like, I see the results as they're coming in. And at first it was like 100% said no, but that's starting to change. So that's a good thing. Um, there's a lot of wonderful um, opportunities. And um, while we're waiting for the data to come in, um, I want to thank Jeremy for all of that information. And um, we're going to have some questions at the end. So I definitely want um, those of you to hang in there um, if you have any questions for either Audrey or um, Jeremy about their model. And so it looks like um, we're about done and it's about 10%, uh, 90% breakdown of 10% have applied to be part of an artist in residence program, 90% have not. So um, um, we've got a lot of, of growing to do and I hope this will um, inspire some people to um, look at the possibilities. And we're gonna go on to our next speaker and I'm not sure if he's arrived, but I'd like to share a little bit about um, what he's done. And um, 
he was in some respects, some of the inspiration we had talked here at IANTA about um, featuring uh, Native Americans as artists in residence. And Delbert Anderson, um, who has not um, been able to join us um, this morning, um, is a remarkable musician and plays jazz, Navajo. Um, I had seen him perform and was blown away and wanted to know who he was and had started following him on social media. And um, he posted almost immediately after I started following him that he had just been awarded the artist in residency with the National Park Service at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park um, later this year. And he already, he hasn't been there yet, and he's already planning on um, composing new compositions dedicated to each of the volcanoes in the park. Um, I mean, he's he's really um, exciting to think about. I have a link down there on this particular slide. This is just one of, I wanna say maybe a hundred tracks. Um, if you go to his website, you can listen to his music. It's absolutely haunting because um, he really combines a lot of um, tribal music, um, traditional songs and chant in with um, jazz and like he mentioned funk, but some of it was just ethereal music. Um, and depending on which musicians he's partnering with, um, the um, you know, whether he has percussion or sax and so on. He has his own band, but every once in a while he performs with, with lots of others. If we could go to the next slide, excuse me. So I'm, I'm sorry he's not with us because he has stories to tell. Um, as soon as I found out, I'm like, oh, he got this thing in Hawaii. He's gonna be going to that. Um, like yourself, Jeremy, he has been going from one residency to another. I follow his social media. I'm like, where are you today? <laughs> I'm like, he's everywhere. Um, so this past spring, he did in fact get one of those residencies at the Institute of American Indian Art. Um, and in addition to performing at this location that you see here on the screen um, at the Institute, they have a wonderful performing arts center now. And I think the next slide might be an image from the theater inside there. Oh no, this gives you an idea of his itinerary with this residency. He was in Santa Fe for a month and he played, he played so many places like every couple of days at um, different locations in Santa Fe proper and around the region. Um, <clears throat> and worked with a lot of different communities in that way. So it was sponsored by IAIA, but he really made the most of uh, impacting um, the community, um, getting the music out there and starting a lot of interesting conversations um, where there was, you know, it was performance and in some places it was also um, being able to talk with, with other musicians and other Native American artists. If we could go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that I think he's um, he shared again on some of it his on his social media. A couple of these he shared with me, um, where he was extremely nimble, and not everybody is is like that. He carved out a space for, in addition to his performing, he was also composing. So he wanted to um, have the space that he had to inspire him to think about some new works. And so you can see on the right, he's working on new compositions in a carved out office space that looks like it might have had been used for storage or whatever that he was using as a space for his, his quiet time. And then musicians also have to practice. Um, so he would, different musicians came in to jam with him and also to play different parts of um, his new musical pieces to test them out before they went on in performance. And, and they were able to use some classroom spaces as well as theaters. Um, if you could go to the next one. So again, this is uh, changing audiences. Um, this I think is back at 
home. He went um, to in Farmington area in the Four Corners area in New Mexico, where he played um, for students in a gym. Um, you know, there's so there's high end theaters, opera houses, concert halls, and then also um, playing for different uh, members of the community. And I think that's something that he um, really wanted to build into um, all of his residencies so he could meet the um, not only um, variety of audiences there, but also in some ways serving the native audiences that he's in the communities that he's in. And also um, providing lectures. Uh, this was at IAIA. So it's a Native American um, Arts Institute. And um, there are pro now performing arts majors there. It's a relatively new program. And so he talked, he was able to talk to them about um, changing roles in performance and probably tips on, on you know, back of the house backstage sorts of things that people need to know as they become professional artists. So he, he um, also did some teaching as well. Then to large groups and small groups. Um, this was in the, in, um, this was at the Museum of Contemporary Native Art and um, which is affiliated with the Institute of American Indian Art. And um, it's, there's a museum there connected and so you never know who's going to be coming into the museum. So audiences large and small. And then one of the places that he played, um, that he still pops into once in a while, if you're lucky, um, is at La Fonda, which is a hotel. It's not native owned. It's, it's right off the plaza in Santa Fe. And um, he set up several gigs there too. Um, and it's a really great intimate space if you want to hear some incredible, mostly jazz, not always. Um, but there was also downtime and there's a lot of travel time. And I know he's um, he's been traveling this week. So I have a feeling he's in a green room somewhere. <laughs> um, and he, he, but he has developed some interesting collaborations like when he did the residency in Santa Fe. So there were residences, um, what am I going to say? There were restaurants and cafes that said, oh, I want him to come play. And so he was able to um, set up times where he was, um, I don't know if you can see the drum set in the background and the upright bass, um, teeny weeny little stage that was set up for um, their trio um, that he performed in this um, restaurant space. And there's Delbert. <laughs> He's not with us today, but I I highly encourage you. There are videos online, and his music is astounding. Um, so whether you want to book him or just listen to his music, um, he's truly inspirational. One of the things that he did, which was amazing to me, while he was at the IAIA um, residency, and this is where it, you get to uh, opportunities where. It's a little, there was lots of performance, but also there was time for him to do research and time to do, um, it, the residency allowed him time to do research and time to do writing. And one of the things that he found was there was an old hymnal um, from around the turn of the century that had, was written in Navajo. And it was original music that was performed by a Navajo trumpeter like himself named Jacob Morgan, who had performed in the Union Army and came out of that and wrote music and had never had, he had never heard it before. And he orchestrated it for his band. And he just finished another residency. He finished the IAIA residency and did another one that was promoted by South Arts Touring. Um, and um, he's been f performing Jacob Morgan's music for the first time in a century, um, which is really inspiring. So he used the residency that he had had to learn more and research and elevate this other artist and um, um, the historical past um, so that people could learn more about Navajo musical history and also hear it. And so... Um, I haven't heard Jacob Morgan's music yet, but I'm looking forward to the next regional um, concert that I can catch. And I think we have another question. 
So um, tying this up to the ends, for those of you who are attending, have you ever taken advantage of listing your events or destination or business, galleries, performances um, on nativeamerica.travel, which is run by IANTA, but it is a site that's used very often by um, tour operators from around the world to build itineraries, especially for those who are interested in traveling to Native American um, both historic sites, cultural sites. Um, it's completely free to um, put up a profile for your tribe, for your culture center, for any of those kinds of things. Um, we did at the very beginning in the chat, we shared a link for um, the Choctaw Culture Center, which has a wonderful entry. So thank you for that, Audrey and your colleagues. And um, it looks like 70% um, have not put anything on native travel, nativeamerica.travel, and about 10% have, and 25% and a growing number, looks like, almost 30% would like to learn more. So we're happy about that. And um, feel free to contact me um, at, um, at the end of this webinar. I would be happy to send you Forms, you can fill them out and send them and hit send. You can load up photographs, however much you want, whatever content you want. And if for any reason you have any technical difficulties, which sometimes happens, things get glitchy, um, you can give me a call and we can walk you through and help you load all of that stuff up. So if we could um, go to the next slide. Um, Jenny, we're going to thank you so much for being here. We're going to introduce you. And um, as I mentioned before, Jenny Turman is um, joining us from the National Endowment for the Arts. Before we um, wrap it up, I think we had a slide with some uh, National Endowment for the Arts links. Um, right before this one, I don't see it, but. Um, Oh, I can Sherry put them in the in the chat. We're going to put them in the chat. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, so um, we have a lot of opportunities um, to listen to hear about on how to get started with your residency program um, and how to promote it. So Jenny, you're on. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank you, Melanie. And I know I'm going to try to be really brief. Are we trying to wrap up by one? I mean, one my time. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I only have a couple minutes. Well, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you to Melanie and thank you to Ayanta for inviting me today. My name is Jenny Terman. Um, quickly, I am joining you today from my home in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and that's the ancestral land of the Shawnee and Massawamek. And I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the Artist Communities and Presenting and Multidisciplinary Work Specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts, which Melanie mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. Um, and I also serve on the agency's Native Arts Working Group. And really briefly, I'm going to share information about resources that NEA has available for artist residency programs. Um, as I said, I work in the Artist Communities uh, Program at the NEA, and that is our designated funding pool for artist residency programs. Um, our primary grant program at the NEA is called Grants for Arts Projects. Uh, that is the program through which we fund the widest range of arts projects. Pretty much anything you can think of under um, the umbrella of the arts can be funded under there with you know, a few exceptions. We have some unallowable project types um, listed on our website you can check out. But the Grants for Arts Projects um, those grants range from $10,000 to $100,000, and they require at least a one-to-one -one match of non-federal funds. So, for example, what that means is if you apply um, for a $10,000 grant, our minimum grant amount, uh, you would be required to match that with another $10,000 of non-federal funds. Um, it, and it could also, it can be a combination of in-kind contributions and other, you know, grants from foundations or um, individual donations or ticket revenue, for example. Um, and those... Um, so 10,000 plus 10,000 would be a minimum total project cost of $20,000. So that's just an example. Um, 
in order to apply for an NEA grant uh, for the Grants for Arts projects, we have two application deadlines per year, one in February and one in July. Um, that's coming up soon on July 6th. And you, uh, you can only apply for one a year, so you have to choose between the February and July deadline. However, if you're interested in applying to artist communities, we actually only accept applications at the February deadline. Um, artist community, there, so there are, under Grants for Arts projects, there are about 15 different what we call artistic disciplines, but some of them are, are what you would expect as an artistic discipline like dance, music, theater, and then some are a little less discipline, discipline-y, <laughs> which is like artist communities, for example. Um, artist communities, as I said, is our designated funding pool for residency programs. Um, we define that in artist communities as a programs that provide time, space, and resources to artists so that they can work on their own artistic practice. Um, and by resources, we mean things like lodging, stipends, um, materials, equipment, facilities, technical support, things like that. Um, and also applications submitted under artist communities, um, the most competitive applications tend to employ a, an open application process and a juried, a juried selection process. That's not a requirement under artist communities, but those do tend to be the most competitive. Um, if that doesn't sound specifically like a residency program that you have in mind or that you're thinking about implementing at your organization, um, we do support all other types of residency programs at the NEA, but they would probably fall under our other artistic disciplines. Um, really quickly, I don't think I mentioned what our eligibility requirements are. Um, in order to apply, uh, the applicant must be a 501c3 nonprofit organization or a unit of state or local government or a federally recognized tribe. Uh, additionally, the applicant must have at least three years of arts programming history. Um, so I see I've already gone over time, so I don't want to... Um, go any further, but I think we also uh, included some links to about our Challenge America grant program, which is another more specific grant program that we have at the NEA, um, but you can check out um, what that is specifically for on our website um, by following those links. It might be of interest to you as well. Thanks. I, I, we aired on the side of caution. Um, we have, if you scroll up in the chat, you can see all of the um, NEA grants for arts projects, artist communities, um, a link for contacts so you can actually reach Jenny, um, and grants for arts projects and artistic disciplines, and then the Challenge America grant um, and Challenge America contacts um, to learn more about the National Endowment for the Arts and how it can support residencies as well as other programs. Um, then we added in a sizable list of some residencies that you might want to apply for now, including the IAIA residency, which um, uh, Delbert participated in that goes on um, throughout the year. They have um, different months that they accept those, um, but those are those are rolling um, um, opportunities. Um, the Grand Canyon Conservancy um, just posted that they have an artist in residence program is looking for Native American artists right now. I think the deadline is in July. And then um, there are some residencies that I wanted to list um, that you might want to apply for later. The Pi Foundation, which is a, a Native Hawaiian organization that has an amazing performing arts center as well as a museum, um, has an exchange program. Tulsa Artist Fellowship has awards. Um, Alaska Museums, um, this is not necessarily a native run program, but it hosts native artists in particular from Alaska. Um, Denver Museum also has a very focused, it's a public museum that hosts a native arts residency. And um, Forge Project that you mentioned, Jeremy, we also wanted to go ahead and list, list that, as well as Crow's Shadow, which is a print workshop up in Oregon that hosts Native American artists. Um, there's some amazing um, activity going on and things that are in planning. And as we learned 
from our early poll um, and talking with you guys, I think that um, there's only maybe three or four um, indigenous artist residencies that are hosting right now in the entire country. So there's lots of opportunity for growth. Um, and there's lots of opportunities for native artists to be in those places and any place. Um, I encourage you to take a look um, that the Native Arts and Cultures or, um, Organization um, Foundation has um, information about opportunities for artists and residencies. In fact, there's a, a link that we shared about um, another artist, um, Adrian Wall, who shared about what it was like when he was on his IAIA residency and what happened while he was there and what he learned from it. And um, so there's a lot of um, resources for learning more about um, what can what you can do with all of those and all of those who will be um, who are participating and who signed up for this webinar um, will get a copy of all of these attached um, following the webinar and um, um, somebody asked about national parks that have artist residencies and I thought we had a slide on here and I had two iterations of my um, PowerPoint, and I think we didn't get that slide in here, but the national, if you go to the National Park Service and Artists in Residency, they actually have a map. You can zoom in and there are over 30 national parks that host artist residencies. And so um, I definitely encourage you to look at that map if you can't find it. Again, um, feel free to contact me um, at, um, at uh, M. Laborwit at IANTA. And um, we have a last slide, which has everybody's contact information for those of you who want to follow up. Um, and again, Jenny, I apologize. Um, we want to pop that in, um, your contact information. Um, I will be sending that out with everybody. We have a different slide. <laughs> um, that I just put it in the chat, Melanie. You name it. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to make sure that um, Everybody, feel free to contact us should you have questions, um, want to learn more about the different residencies as they're going on and the opportunities that we have. I'd like to encourage all of those who are attending um, to sign up, if you like, for the newsletter with IANTA. We often have, in addition to just news of what's going on with us and Native tourism, we also send out a monthly uh, newsletter with resources for, and um, I think you might find that helpful. I hope some of you are inspired to create a residency at your museum, hotel, or other tribal facility. This webinar has been recorded and will be emailed to all registrants. It will be also archived on our website if you have friends and colleagues who did not attend who wish to watch thereafter. Thank you so much to the National Endowment for the Arts for helping to make this program possible. And um, please follow us at aianta.org slash webinar for future webinars hosted by IANTA. If you're not a member of IANTA and would like to be, please contact Gail Chihak, Tribal Relations and Outreach Manager, and you can do so by visiting our website at ianta.org. Um, memberships are uh, might be advantageous even for artists and you can list your artwork in our shop native, which is another resource to check out and broaden your audiences. And don't forget to make sure you're listed in nativeamerica.travel. Tour operators are looking to come by to visit you and listings are always free for artists and cultural attractions. We appreciate you so much for being here today and thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs>